our next speaker is Kate Wilson, and Kate won a massive legal victory on Friday. She is a fighter and a campaigner. She's been involved in this from the start, and um, you know we congratulate her, but also really pleased to have her to tell her story for the meeting. Kate Wilson. Um, I'm here because I uh, had a relationship with a man that I knew as Mark Stone. Um, I met Mark in 2003 at, a, at an open political meeting in Nottingham that was beginning to mobilise against the uh, G8 summit that was coming in 2005 to Scotland. Um, within, I think, about two weeks of that meeting, we had started a, a relationship. He was charming, we shared a lot of interests. I, I feel like I've repeated this a lot now. Um, and there's, there's a whole load of sort of unbelievable facts about the time that we spent together. I mean, we, he moved into a house with me and some friends and we lived together for um, over a year. He visited my parents on numerous occasions, they're actually here this evening, and he attended my grandmother's 90th birthday, and he was my partner in, in just about everything for two years. And then we separated and we remained friends right up until um, 2010. He visited me, I lived abroad during that time, he visited me in Spain, he visited me in Germany, we met up on visits to France. Um, and it's, it's very difficult because of how, how big and how shocking the story is to try and convey the sort of ordinariness of that relationship. It, 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 you know, it, was, it wasn't something kind of big and dramatic. We were partners, we were living together. It wasn't, it wasn't James Bond. I mean, I've heard a lot of people talk about like how you know, you think about spies having relationships, and it, and it really wasn't like that. It was, he was getting really deeply involved in, in family life. We were having community discussions about how to organize the washing up. Um, and while he was doing all of that, I later found out in 2010 <laughs> when I got a call from the people who had discovered that he had in fact been a police officer, he was married with two children and he was at work um, during all that time. Um, and when I first got the phone call, I think I kind of think back and there was a moment when I first got the phone call when I, I think probably I, I, my response to it was like, oh, was he? Okay, thanks for calling. And then sort of put the phone down and and then from that moment, it, it sort of like, it's like the cracks start to spread out and it starts to, everything starts to fall apart and it starts to affect all of your memories. You look back and suddenly it changes everything in all of your memories. It also <coughs> changes everything sort of into the future because as you meet new people, it, it's there. And, and if you, as you try to be involved in political organising, it's there. And I mean, even being at a meeting like this, you know, you're, it's there. Um, and uh, and I've, it, it's, it's very difficult to talk about, I'm afraid. And it's, it, it's very, very difficult to get people to understand what it feels like because I'm not totally sure I really understand um, <coughs> what I'm trying to explain to you. and. Um, in the beginning, it's, it felt like a very, very deep personal loss and a personal betrayal, um, particularly because Mark, unlike some of the other officers, Mark hadn't actually disappeared. He was appearing in the Daily Mail giving interviews. And, uh, um, and then, then I started to find out that there were other women that this had happened to as well, and I had um, the amazing experience of being part of this group of women who decided to bring this court case against the police and and we had um, I mean that it, it's it's going to be an amazing book one day um, but we, we we had these meetings where we would talk about 
what it felt like and about the relationships and, re and remember the things that had happened and and it's it started to change from from being a personal betrayer and you started to understand that that what had felt like meeting someone who was really perfect and, and shared your interests was actually a, a sort of form of psychological ma manipulation that I think is known as mirroring um, where the person that you're talking to is reflecting back what they think you want them to hear and this person who it's very easy to be the perfect person in somebody's life when you actually don't exist you're playing a role um, and start to realize that, that the moments that you shared with that person that, that felt like very very um, intense emotional connections that you were having were actually quite cynical forms of emotional manipulation and so you know I, I know that when Mark was telling me about how his father abandoned him as a child that was a lie his parents are still together and, and, and he grew up with with his parents together um, and then you also hear about the exit strategies and, and I think the, the story that um, was on Newsnight on Monday about Andrea who's this new woman and, and again you see this this deeply deeply distressing exit strategies and the way that they they could transmit have transmitted to their partners that they were having emotional breakdowns and how distressing that is for um, the people that, that go through it and and you start to understand that the person that you had the relationship with actually didn't exist and then and, and, and this really really came home to me when I read Rob Evans and Paul Lewis's book Undercover then you start to realize that you didn't just have a relationship with a man who didn't exist you had a relationship with a man who didn't exist and the backroom and the managers and the superior officers who were making the decisions about that relationship and the, the support teams that were following him around on your holidays and the people who were listening to your phone calls and the people who were reading your emails and the people who were possibly taking photographs of you as you walked together down the street um, and you start to understand that these units have been systematically abusing women since 1968 um, and the the language that we have been using to describe that and I, again I think we have to thank the Lawrence family for this is um, that the, the Metropolitan Police have been institutionally sexist in their handling of these relationships and in their use of undercover officers but I guess most of you probably will have seen the apology that was issued by the Metropolitan Police to the other seven women from the group that I'm in and um, to hear the Metropolitan Police saying that they violated our human rights um, on publicly on video was, was really quite impressive and, um, and also uh, on Friday they, my, my, case, my case continued and uh, on Friday we went to court and they just withdrew their defence and uh, accepted liability uh, for <coughs> the things that we have been accusing them of, which, um, which is deceit, um, assault and battery, misfeasance in public office and negligence. And for me the significant thing about last Friday is that misfeasance in public office and negligence are actually not issues about the activities of the undercover officers themselves but we're talking about the activities of their supervisors and their managers um, so so yeah for me what happened on Friday is basically saying is that yeah the police are, go are, are going to accept that supervisors and managers were responsible for what was going on and knew what was going on because because misfeasance in public office means they knew and they were they didn't or they, they were I don't quite know how to describe it. I'm not so good with the legal stuff I have to say <laughs> um, but um, but yeah it means that they knew and it means that they were complicit in that um, but I still don't feel um, that we have had a victory 
as such because I know that the reason why they withdrew their defence and even the reason why they issued that apology is because they will do anything to avoid having to open those files and let people know what was really going on. Um, and the, the more they step down and, and make these concessions without opening those files, the more I start to wonder what on earth the horrors are that they are hiding. The apology and them standing down in our court case has come after four years of the police being <coughs> unbelievably obstructive and bullying in their response to our case. Um, and also of us having to reveal huge amounts of deeply personal information to the courts and to the police and to the police solicitors over the course of four years and receiving absolutely nothing in return. And that that whole process has certainly for me been as damaging as the finding out that, um, that Mark in fact didn't exist has been this process of being up against this brick wall where they're refusing to give answers and, and now it seems like they're starting to, to shift but still actually they haven't opened any of those files and they haven't given us anything. And more importantly, there are still women who are going through that obstructive and bullying process, and there are still women who may have to go through that obstructive and bullying process. Um, Andrea, whose case went public on Monday, is just starting that court process. And there are still women, I am sure, who don't know that this has happened to them. Um, and unlike the family justice campaigns that we've been hearing about, no women have had the police show up and say that we're terribly sorry but we have to inform you that, that we found out that you were the victim of um, an abusive undercover operation. Um, I think this is because they're lying. I think that it's because they're covering it up. They are saying that there were, quote, failures of supervision and management and they claim or imply and have done for a very, very long time that they have no idea that these relationships were taking place. Now, if they had no idea that these relationships were taking place, then I have, don't really understand how they are proposing that the public inquiry investigate these relationships unless they release the cover names, because by the police's own admission, their supervisors were not aware that this was going on. Um, so unless they release the cover names and unless they allow people to come forward and say that officer did this to me, um, then we're never going to get to the truth in this. We are also core participants, my, the, the group that I brought the case with in the inquiry. Um, I would very, very much like to see it being a really robust and transparent process that does actually get to the truth. Um, I don't know how long I want to be part of that inquiry and be legitimising something that is just going to be a cover-up and if they don't release the names then I think we should be thinking about pulling out and saying it's, it's, not, it's not real.